हेलो एंड वेलकम टू टुडेज क्लास टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू रीड दिस चैप्टर फंडामेंटल यूनिट ऑफ लाइफ आई एम बास ऑफ दत्ता रथ एंड दिस इज चैप्टर फाइव ऑफ योर क्लास नाइन साइंस बुक टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू कवर द फर्स्ट हाफ ऑफ दिस चैप्टर सो फ्रेंड्स लेट सी वॉट आर द टॉपिक्स दैट आर गोइंग टू बी कवर्ड इन दिस चैप्टर सो इन दिस चैप्टर वी आर गोइंग टू लर्न अबाउट डिस्कवरी ऑफ सेल we will understand the definition of cell we will understand the cell theory we will know about shape size and number of cells and we will know about the types of cells and we will understand the structure of cell we will understand the structure of cell membrane nucleus cell wall cytoplasm all the cell organelles and also we will understand cell transport friends Let's start this lesson with a short story. Many many years ago in 1665 there was a curious scientist named Robert Hooke. Well, you may say all the scientists are curious and that's true also. So this scientist Robert Hooke who belonged to England once took a self-designed microscope and a thin slice of cork. Self-designed microscope yes self designed microscope he took a self designed microscope because at that time around 350 years ago technology was not that much advanced and the microscopes were also not that much advanced so he designed a better microscope for himself that was a compound microscope and he took a thin slice of cork can you say of which material cork is made up of all of you must have seen cork can you say cork is made from the bark of a tree and he absorbed this thin slice of cork under his own his self designed microscope and what did he see he saw a honeycomb like structure having many small compartments now he developed the idea that all living beings are composed of this uh, compartment or box like structures and he named each box like structure as cell with this discovery robert hook introduced the word cell to the entire world at that time nobody had the idea about what cell is nobody had the idea about what living organisms are made up of and robert hook introduced the idea that all living organisms are composed of some compartment like structures can you see what is the exact meaning of cell actually this the word cell has been derived from a latin word and its meaning is a small room so friends this is the story of discovery of cell and today you are uh, reading a lot of information you are getting a lot of information about cell and this is the discovery of cell and cell was first discovery discovered by robert hook in 1665 now friends let's understand the definition of cell what is the definition of cell the cell is a structural and functional unit of living organisms it is the building block of living beings structural and functional unit of living organisms let's understand this structural unit means as you see a building has many rooms each room has few walls and each wall it wall is made up of what bricks so brick is the smallest structural structural unit of the building we can say likewise cell is the structural unit of living organisms you just look at this picture structural organization of living beings if you will observe each organism has uh, several organ systems several organ systems and each organ system consists of several organs and each organ is composed of uh, many tissues and each tissue is composed of several cells so you see cell is the smallest entity smallest unit of the living organisms 
now friends you can you can also say that cell has still smaller components which are called organelles and organelles have still smaller components molecules and molecules are made up of atoms but friends all these are non living units they are found in all non living things and but cell is the unit from where life starts even a single cell can be a single organism cell is an independent unit so cell is the smallest living unit and it is the structural unit so why we call cell is the functional unit of living organisms you see each cell is capable of performing certain basic functions that are carried out in all living organisms like uh, uh, like respiration digestion excretion each cell is capable of performing these functions and cell is the smallest unit that can function independently as i said cell is the smallest cell even one cell can be a complete organism okay so that is why cell is called the functional unit you see as there is division of labor in our body division of labor in our body means in the body of multicellular organisms how as uh, our heart pumps blood as our kidney filters uh, blood as our brain processes information so there is division of labor every organ has its own functions likewise there is division of labor in each cell a cell has many components called organelles and the each organelle performs its own functions so this is why cell is called the functional unit of living living organisms and it is the building block of living beings too so now friends we will learn about will know about some more important cellular discoveries anton van leeuwenhoek he was the first person to observe free cells like bacteria protozoa red blood cells and sperms in 1674 he took pond water and observed under a microscope which was still a better microscope than used that used by robert hooke and he observed free living cells in pond water and also he observed red blood cells and sperms and then robert brown in 1831 discovered nucleus nucleus is the most important part of the cell he discovered the nucleus which is the uh, brain of the cell in 1831 and in 1839 perkins a introduced the term protoplasm it's another important term protoplasm it's the fluid substance of the cell it's the entire content of the cell inside except that the except the outermost covering it is the entire content of the cell and this word protoplasm was coined by perkins a and then cell theory was first put by sliden and swan in 1838 and 1839 respectively and what did this theory say plants and animals are composed of cells all the plants and animals are composed of cells and cells are the basic unit of life then In eighteen hundred fifty-five, Warco added another statement to the theory: all cells arise from pre-existing cells. Do you understand the meaning? All cells arise from pre-existing cells means all the new cells they are formed from the old ones. The new cells that are added to the organism they do not come from heaven. they do not come from all of a sudden they always arise from the existing cells from the old cells so the modified cell theory or the modern cell theory states that living organisms are composed of cells and cell products yes living organisms are composed of cells and 
cell products also and all living cells arise from pre-existing cells that I just explained and all cells are basically alike in chemical composition and metabolic processes. No matter what what is the function of the cell, what is the structure of the cell, all the cells are basically same, similar in composition, chemical composition and metabolic processes. So now let's understand about the shape, size and number of cells. Cell shape. So what is the cell shape of a cell? The shape of cells is related to the specific, specific function they can perform. Specific function means usually you see in a book or in any picture we see that plant cell uh, looks uh, rectangular and animal cell is rounded. This is not the case exactly although many plant cells are rectangular in shape but the shape of the cells actually varies and it varies according to the function they perform what kind of function the cells are doing. Let us take some example. Some examples of human cells itself in our body itself. You can see the picture of some uh, cells here. Uh, you can see the red blood cells which are disc shaped. Columnar epithelial cells, tall cells, then smooth muscle cells, spindle shaped cells. And you see the nerve cells which look very peculiar having many branches having root like structure. So this, uh, this structure is because they have to uh, transfer information, they have to carry in information throughout the body. So they have this type of structure. And then you can see sperm cell which has a tail like structure. It has a tail like structure beca because it's a, it has to swim in fluid. So that's why you can see the structure of cell, the shape of the cells varies as per the functions they perform but 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 some cells ha do not have a fixed size some cells like amoeba wbc they do not have a fixed shape their shape varies uh, as per the need so if amoeba wbc you understand white blood cells uh, these cells they do not have a fixed shape they have an irregular shape now come to cell size and then the size of the cell also varies considerably in different animals and plants. Even the size of cell is not fixed. Although almost uh, all the cells are microscopic size, uh, uh, microscopic in size and we cannot uh, see them in naked eye. We need some microscope. Almost all cells except a few cells, uh, almost all cells are microscopic and the average cell size varies from 0 0.5 to 20 micron. You understand a micron or micrometer? 1 micron is 10 to the power minus 6 meter. So you can understand what uh, what is the size of a cell actually. Can we see it uh, in naked eye or not? So the average cell size varies from 0 0.5 to 20 micron. Can you say which is the smallest cell in the world and which is the biggest cell? This is for your GK. Uh, smallest cell is the mycoplasm and the biggest cell is the egg of an ostrich. So this is, these are the smallest and biggest cells. And in human body, the smallest cells are the uh, RBC or red blood cells and the biggest cells are the, in fact the longest cells are the nerve cells. And another thing I would like to add, never you think that uh, the, the, the larger the size of the animal, the larger will be the size of the cell. This is not the case. Size of the animal depends on the number of cells. The higher the number of cells, the larger will be the size of the uh, size of the animal so don't you think that the cell size of an elephant is much larger than the cell size of a cat or a dog or a mouse now friends come to number of cells can you see how many number of cells uh, are needed to make an organism even one cell as i have already said even one cell can form one organism 
and based on this basically there are two types of organisms unicellular organisms and multicellular organ organisms so let us understand this unicellular organisms two types of organisms basically we can say based on the number of cells and unicellular organisms uni means one cellular means cell the one cell one cell organisms are called unicellular organisms this single cell carries out all the basic functions of an organism and example are all the bacteria are unicellular organisms all the bacteria and there are other unicellular organisms like amoeba paramecium euglena etc so all these are examples of unicellular organisms and then multicellular organisms the organisms which are composed of several cells are called multicellular organisms multi means many so many cell organisms are com called multicellular organisms and example all those organisms you see around yourself all those organisms you can see with your naked eyes generally are multicellular organisms they are all multicellular organisms and you see in a multicellular organisms uh, cells are arranged cells are organized it's not that cells are uh, present uh, here and there in the body different types of cells the cells are organized into tissues and you already have idea that tissues are nothing tissues are uh, groups of similar cells that perform a particular function and you know cells form tissues and tissues form organs organs many organs together uh, form an organ system and several organ systems form the entire organism now friends uh, come to types of cells well types of cells broadly scientists have categorized into two basic types of cells two basic types of cells depending on the presence of very important parts of cell there are two basic types of cells prokaryotic cell and eukaryotic cell let us see what are prokaryotic cell and eukaryotic cell prokaryotic cells are primitive and incomplete cells these are very old uh, type of cells uh, the world started with this type of cells actually the world started with prokaryotes and they are primitive and incomplete cells why we uh, say they are incomplete cells because many cell components are missing in these cells their true nucleus is absent here we say true nucleus is absent well or uh, true nucleus means all the components of the nucleus are not present that's why we say true nucleus is absent but the important nuclear material that is chromatin material or chromosome dna molecule that is present in prokaryotic cells but all the other components of the nucleus are missing in prokaryotic cells that's why we say true nucleus is absent then prokaryotes are always unicellular organisms these are these are the simplest life forms on the world and they are always unicellular ne they are never found in multicellular form and what are the examples the examples are bacteria and blue green algae these are the primitive and incomplete cells these are the prokaryotic cells now come to eukaryotic cells and all the other cells other than these prokaryotic cells bacteria and uh, this uh, blue green algae all the other cells they are ad advanced and complete cells they are eukaryotic cells they are advanced and complete because they are why they are complete because they have all the other components of the cell and here true nucleus is present true nucleus is present means all the components of the nucleus are present and eukaryotes example are eukaryotes include all living organisms except those bacteria and blue green algae so now look at this picture so in this picture you see a prokaryotic cell and an eukaryotic cell what did, what do you see here the spherical nucleus is present at the center of the eukaryotic cell the spherical nucleus that purple colored you can see here and that is absent in prokaryotic cell 
and instead there is some thread like structures you can say entangled mass of thread like structures that is present and here in eukaryotic cell we call it nucleus and in prokaryotic cell it is called nucleoid actually and you can also see many important other components inside the cell are not found in prokaryotic cell in eukaryotic cell you can see several components uh, inside the cell which are missing in prokaryotic cell then come to structure of cell so basically all the cells basically all the cells have three basic components cell membrane or plasma membrane cytoplasm and its contents and nucleus cell membrane you see we will study about all these uh, basic components we will start with cell membrane now cell membrane is also called plasma membrane it's also called plasma membrane we will learn about cell membrane now it's the outermost covering of the cell it's the outermost covering of the cell it is the outermost membrane which separates all the contents of the cell from the external environment it's leaving thin delicate elastic and selectively permeable membrane this membrane is thin it's delicate it means it's soft it's elastic means it's stretchable and selectively permeable membrane can you understand the meaning of selectively permeable permeable means it permits it allows certain substances to move across it and selectively permeable means it does not allow all the substances but it allows only a few certain substances selectively permeable selective substances to move across it and why it is called leaving yes it is called leaving because it is elastic it it is selectively permeable that's why it is called leaving membrane and it is made up of lipids and proteins you can you can see uh, this picture uh, this uh, plasma membrane is made up of a bilayer lipid layer uh, and protein molecules embedded in between but in plant cells plasma membrane is not exactly the outermost covering in plant cells that is exception there is an extra covering outside the plasma membrane it is called cell wall we will learn about cell wall too and here you just uh, look at this funny picture this picture explains how plasma membrane is selectively permeable you can compare the plasma membrane with the door of this room which is allowing only water molecule to come inside and carbon dioxide molecule to move outside and it is not allowing dirt molecules dirt particles to move inside so this is how plasma membrane is selectively permeable and now let us see the function of the plasma membrane yes plasma membrane separates the cellular material from the external environment it keeps the cellular material inside itself it acts as an effective barrier and regulates the entry of substances in and out of the cell it's it acts as an effective barrier means it uh, uh, prevents entry of certain substances uh, undesirable substances and it controls the entry of substances in and out of the cell then it maintains the shape of the cell specifically in animal cells because in animal cells it is the outermost membrane next come to transport of materials across plasma membrane we just learned that substances can pass across the plasma membrane because plasma membrane is selectively permeable it permits certain substances to move across it into and out of the cell so how this movement of substances occurs across plasma membrane so basically by two processes substances move across the cell membrane so what are these processes diffusion and osmosis diffusion you already have some idea about diffusion diffusion is the spontaneous movement of molecules of a substance 
from a region of its higher concentration to a region of its lower concentration. That means uh, in a region where more number of molecules are present of the same substance and uh, another reason where lower uh, lower number of molecules or less number of molecules are present. So, molecules will flow from the region of their higher concentration where they are more present more in number to the region of the lower concentration and this is free movement, this is spontaneous movement, we, this does not uh, need any force. So, this spontaneous movement of molecules from the region of their higher concentration to the region of their lower concentration is called diffusion and some substances like oxygen, carbon dioxide move across the cell mem membrane by this diffusion. You just look at this picture, uh, uh, this picture is explaining how oxygen enters into the cell. You know blood brings oxygen to every cell because every cell carries out respiration, cellular respiration. So, when blood carries uh, oxygen to each cell, then what happens? The concentration of oxygen will be higher outside the cell than inside the cell. So, uh, how the oxygen molecules will move now? Oxygen molecules will move from the outer environment into the cell because the concentration of oxygen is higher outside the cell than inside the cell. So, now what will happen? So, this is the movement of oxygen. So, now what will happen? When after the cellular respiration, respiration takes place inside the cell, what will happen? There will be production of what? Carbon dioxide because uh, carbon dioxide is produced during respiration. So, now there will be the concentration of carbon dioxide will be more inside the cell than outside the cell. So, which way carbon dioxide will move? Carbon dioxide will move from inside the cell to outside environment, outside the cell. So, this is how diffusion is the process by which carbon dioxide and oxygen move across the cell membrane. Now, let us know about three types of solutions here, I, hypotonic solution, isotonic solution and hypertonic solution. Tell me what will happen if a cell is kept in a sugar or a salt solution? Probably you do not know the answer, let us see. And friends you know what is osmosis? Osmosis is a special type of diffusion actually, is a special type of diffusion where only movement of water molecules takes place. Movement of water molecules takes place from the region of higher water concentration to the region of lower water concentration when two solutions are separated by a permeable membrane, by, by a semi permeable membrane. This is called osmosis and we will see osmosis in plant cell how water molecules move across cell membrane. We will start with this hypotonic solution. You see when concentration of water is higher outside the cell means the solution we are talking about is very dilute solution where concentration of water is very high then what will happen? Water molecules will move into the cell water molecules will move into the cell because concentration of water is higher outside than the cytoplasm. You know cytoplasm contains about 60 percent water. So, this movement of water into the cell is called endosmosis and endosmosis because of this endosmosis what happens? The cell swells up, gains water and swells up. This is called endosmosis. And what about hypertonic solution we will see. Hypertonic solution means when the concentration of water in the external environment is very low means the water is very concentrated, it is a, a concentrated solution, concentration of water is low in comparison to the cell. What will happen? The molecules, water molecules will move outside the cell, move out of the cell this is called exosmosis. So, endosmosis and exosmosis occur 
in case uh, whether uh, when it's a hypotonic solution endosmosis occurs and when there is a hypertonic solution exosmosis occurs but what will happen if both the solution means cytoplasm and the external solution have the same concentration of water what will happen can you say there will be no net movement of water molecules you see in all these cases you cannot say water moves only in one direction water molecules move bo in both directions but more water molecules will move from the region of higher water concentration to the region of lower water concentration so that there will be some sort of equilibrium there will be balance okay now come to plasmolysis as i said when cell is kept in an hypertonic solution what will happen because of exosmosis cells will lose water the cell will lose water and there is shrinkage or contraction of the contents of the cell the cell contents will shrink away from the cell wall which is the outermost covering of the cell the cell contents will shrink because there will be loss of water there will be exosmosis and this phenomenon is known as plasmolysis so uh, do you understand what is plasmolysis when there is loss of water from the cell because of exosmosis there is shrinkage of the contents of the cell and this is called plasmolysis and endocytosis in amoeba and because of this flexibility of plasma membrane plasma it helps to take in food and other material from external environment here in this picture you can see how amoeba is getting its food through endocytosis it's how it's capturing food by using its plasma membrane and this process is called endocytosis so now friends let us answer some questions so these questions are there question number 1 who discovered cells and how answer is robert hook took a thin slice of cork and observed it under a microscope he saw a honeycomb like structure having small compartments and he named each compartment as cell question 2 why is the cell called the structural and functional unit of life the cell is called the structural and functional unit of life because it is the smallest and basic unit of any organism each living cell is capable of performing certain basic functions that are characteristics of living organisms cell is the smallest unit which can function independently question 3 How do substances like carbon dioxide and water move in and out of the cell? Answer is with the process of diffusion the substances like carbon dioxide and water move in and out of the cell. If the concentration level of carbon dioxide and water is higher in an external environment then then inside the cell then water and carbon dioxide move inside and in case if their concentration level is low they move outside then why is the plasma membrane called a selectively permeable membrane the plasma membrane is called selectively permeable membrane because it permits the movement of only certain substances in and out of the cell it allows some materials to pass pass through it and blocks the other materials from entering through it so children we covered the first half of this chapter fundamental unit of life today and we will cover the rest half in the next session thank you